we're talking anything Emacs related, we're talking about, I mean, there's going to be programming involved. Now, my session tends to be much more programming involved than even your typical Emacs uh, talk. So the question is, programming experience, Lisp specific programming experience, everybody has basic understanding. Um, so I will not talk that much about Emacs Lisp. There is some Emacs Lisp at the end uh, that I will demonstrate. Uh, but primarily it will be Common Lisp and its integration into Emacs and how a normal application development workflow uh, can look like. And in this specific case, uh, I will be talking about an application that I've worked on for a little while. Um, it's essentially, it started out as a, uh, we needed an alternative to Slack because Slack was online, we couldn't use an online service, so we had to use something uh, uh, that can run on our own servers. And um, turns out at the time there wasn't anything. So we decided, we figured it can't be that difficult to put, put something together, so we did. Uh, and in a few months we have something fairly decent. Uh, it's been running in production for quite a long time at our office. And um, <clears throat> so I developed the server side uh, and the server is written in Common Lisp. And the client is written in Clojure Script, um, which is, uh, but I wrote perhaps only about 15% of that code. Um, maybe 20, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, um, so just a little bit background what, what's going on. Uh, there is the entire system is uh, stores all its data in CouchDB. <coughs> there is a, uh, all the uh, components communication between the different modules is done using uh, RabbitMQ. And I would like to thank Pivotal for actually supporting that product. It's pretty awesome. And uh, then there's some memcache and some uh, sol solar um, for free text search and things like that. So anyway, um, when how many of you have developed a real application in Lisp or maybe or Smalltalk perhaps that also has a similar uh, you? All right. So Lisp development is quite different or somewhat different from typical development, let's say C++ or Java or even Ruby, in that you don't, you don't normally write your code, compile it, run it, test it, and then restart. That loop does not exist. So anyone who has tested, maybe you guys have, have, have tried out uh, you know, a, a, a Lisp uh, a tutorial or something like that, where you, uh, you start a session, probably something like this, and then the tutorial tells you, oh, you can type plus one, two, and it gives you three. Great, and you can print something on the screen. Great, but then what? And when I've talked to people that wanted to use this to develop an application, they really didn't get much further than this because they didn't really figure out, okay, where's, what's the next step? How do I actually develop an application? How do I take advantage of this pretty awesome tool, which is Emacs, Slime, and Common Lisp, to actually do a real application? So uh, I'm going to skip now uh, project definitions and things like that, and just suffice it to say that once you have a project definition and set up all the paths and everything, all you do is to load the application like this. This will, uh, if any files were changed, they will be compiled. If, uh, and, and then uh, the, the, the compiled files goes into the cache. So when you reload the application, it's very fast. But if I were to flush the cache now, my slow machine would take quite a long time to compile, probably a minute. Um, so, let's just do this, uh, because I'm gonna uh, demonstrate some things later. So, in the, right now, I've loaded the application. It consists of some number of functions, quite a lot. 
and we can open the source. Uh, no, let's just start the application first. Um, So right now, I just ran a function that starts the server. This starts the web server. So we can just do a quick look to see that it runs. And it does. Uh, I, it, it's, it, it remembered my session, I, so I didn't need to log in. Uh, let's try to log in. And let's see if it works. Test, test. Yeah. So, all right. So, what what is what is actually going on here? Right. I have now an application running in uh, a web server is running. We can from within Emacs we can look at the threads. So these are the threads that so have 33, 33 threads right now, and. One of those threads being the interaction thread where I type my commands. So I can, of course, do this still. And I'm now interacting with the runtime that is actually doing all the web stuff here. That means that I can interact with the running system. So let's say, for example, that I want to um, load a user. So I have uh, load user by email and this test user has full at full.com. Now, this, now this is quite obvious. I simply loaded it, I loaded an object, um, and this loads from the database with some caching and all the magic, but never mind. And this represents, this is an, uh, this. Uh, shows me that it has now loaded this object that represents this user here. Now, but, and this is a really, in my opinion, a quite neat feature in, uh, in, uh, in Slime, that because of this is red, it means that this is not just the text that represents the object that I loaded. It actually contains inside of, uh, of it a reference to the underlying object in the Lisp machine that is running. Which means that I can go to this line and press Ctrl C, Ctrl V, Tab, and this shows me the actual. So uh, the user is actually an instance of an object of the, and it tells, shows me here that the class is a class user, and here are the fields. And you know we can uh, manipulate these fields. For example, we can change the description here. Uh, so we set the description new description. Here. Okay. Now, it actually changed the object that is inside the Lisp runtime. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that I can go in and manipulate actually li actual live objects in the system. So, and this even survives copy and paste. So, I can, for example, copy this. And do a uh, I don't know type of I call type of which returns the, the, the classes like in Java dot class or dot get class uh, and tells me that this is type uh, of type user. Now had I written something like this, whatever something, uh, I would get an error because. Uh, Hash less than is not a valid character. But what this shows is that the thing I pasted in here isn't actually the string, it's actually the object that is represented by that string inside the, uh, the, 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 inside the Lisp uh, the, the, the runtime. So I can even take this and then I say, for example, uh, so I built a, an, uh, um, oh, before we do that, let's, let's just take a look again at, so I can obviously do quick jumps, so when I press uh, make a dot, I can jump to whatever I'm pointing at, in this case I'm pointing at an instance of an object, so it jumps to the source code that defines this object, so this defines the class, description, extend class with blah 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 blah, I have some magic uh, here, uh, special meta class that 
uh, allows me to, using only this definition here, to transparently map objects um, in, uh, uh, in instances to uh, a persisted object in CouchDB. So we can take a look at that just for now. The actual primary key in CouchDB is this. Oops, sorry. It's actually this. So I can copy this here. And let's go to CouchDB uh, here. And let's take a look at this object. So we can see it, it created a CouchDB object as well. So I didn't have to write any CouchDB code to persist the object. It's all handled automatically by the system. And it's propagated all the way uh, to the web application as well. So if I decide to save this object, if you keep your eye on this, once I save this object, since I change the name, it should automatically change in the session here. So uh, let's sit, try this. Uh, it should work because I've used it quite extensively. So I just save that instance and it updates all the way to the browser. Now, the way this works is, I well, um, if it doesn't really matter how it works, it, it, there is there are callbacks being called and, and persistence and, and representations of the object in the in the in the uh, in, on, on the browser side. But never mind. What I want to illustrate here is how you work with objects inside uh, inside the running instance. The entire application runs now, and I can make modifications to the application without actually uh, restarting anything at all. Even an active session will not be touched. So, for example, let's take a look at, uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have played around with something like Ruby on Rails, where you define handlers for a, a web method. So, let's see what, how, how uh, such a thing can um, uh, can be done here. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, this, for example, uh, and let's pick something. I'll tell you what. Let's create a new file. No, let's ah, let's just create something. Let's just add something here. So I can do this uh, here. And let's give it a name, foo screen, for example. And the URL to access this one is slash foo, uh, slash bar, because I think I have a slash foo already. Uh, and let's make it a bit more clever. Let's make it like that, A to Z plus. This is match any regex that matches that. Uh, and let's bind that to a variable uh, v. Oh, sorry. T. Ah, no. Now, as soon as someone, if I were to now go to this page, I, the resource is not found. Right? Because I haven't actually, this, I just typed the, the, the entry now. The URL is bar. I would get the same one for bar because I'm not there, right? So, let's simply return a string. Hello. And what I can do in Slime is if I want to compile just a single function or a single form, I just go to the form and I press Ctrl C, Ctrl C. And that gave me an error. Oh, okay. Let's do this. Format, nil, hello. So what this does is essentially it uh, some name, so make it more clear, some name. What this does is, whenever someone goes to slash bar slash and the sequence of letters, uh, some, the variable sum name will be bound to uh, this string. And now I can press Ctrl C, Ctrl C, and it's compiled that uh, function. It just compiled that function. It didn't compile anything else, just that function. And now that uh, URL is a, is a real working URL. Now. What is interesting here is that since I didn't have to restart anything, that means that 
even if I have an, an existing uh, existing WebSocket connection like here, it's not impacted whatsoever. So this way of developing, I find to be quite, uh, shall we say, liberating, um, because as you can see, there is no there is no comp uh, edit compile test cycle. It's edit and it's all blurs together into one thing, which makes development of these things incredibly simple. Because if I want to change something, hello again, and like this, I just reload the page and change it without anything else being impacted. In fact, and this is something I did not prepare for, so let's see if it works. Um, uh, because I haven't actually tested this in a, in a while. Um, because Slime allows you to communicate with the remote instance of a, of a Lisp instance, I can even connect to a live running production system. So I have a test environment running on the internet, which is here, which is the same, it just have a different set of channels and some stuff here. But what I can do now is I can connect to that instance and I have to um, do a port forward for the for the port that is used to communicate with the running instance. So okay, there. Now, one thing I would like to to uh, mention before uh, I show everything else is that what is running is actually this binary here. This is a pure Linux binary that is generated from the, uh, uh, um, I, I, compiled, I will compile the application into a separate binary that I run. But I can still, let's see if it works. Uh, so let's uh, sayonara this one and kill it and slime connect and local host port 9828 and let's see if it works. And of course it didn't because crap. Okay, it's because the version of the version of slime I'm running here is not matching the version of slime I'm running remotely. Sadly, that means that I can't demonstrate that part. Uh, but suffice it to say, I'll just tell you. <laughs> Essentially, it will. It works exactly the same. Right? There's no difference. What difference? What's this? Uh, there's no difference whatsoever. It looks the same, it works the same. Whenever I choose to go uh, to the source code, it will use tramp, which as you know is a way to transparently access files remotely. Uh, so it uses tramp over SSH to access the actual source file on the remote side. Which means, oh yeah, it doesn't work. It creates the thing, but then I get all of this, these errors. It's really frustrating. Uh, so let's uh, start my local. Let's just do this. Otherwise, I have to wait for the connection to turn off, and it's frustrating and annoying. So. Uh, let's just do this again, and what did I have? 18, right? And slime. And there. And build the application again. Here, as you can see, I modified some a file, and the problem is that file I modified was dependent. All of these were actually dependent on that one, so they decided to recompile all of that stuff as well. But as you can see, it's not that slow. And if you have a fast machine, it's not. It's never really a problem to compile, recompile anything, everything. Uh, so let's start again. So. <coughs> Let's take a look at another interesting aspect of, uh, of this is more of a benefit of commonness rather than, uh, rather than Emacs itself. Emacs just makes it easier to, to show you 
what's actually going on. So if we go to the main page here and we look at the source code, we see, well, HTML. And it, this is all generated by a template. And what template language am I using? Well, I'm a Lisp programmer, so of course I wrote my own. <laughs> so so uh, let's take a look at what it looks like. It's somewhat, uh, it's, quite, it's quite decent uh, ish. Uh, uh, so this one has, uh, this, this stuff should be pretty clear. So let's look at the main logged in. And here we have, so we have some, we have includes, we have some if statements, we can uh, uh, put in some. Uh, it, uh, uh, inject some information that was passed to the uh, code that um, uh, that calls the template. So uh, let's take a look at this, and we go in here, and let's take a look at the and no, what's it called channel. Huh? Show channel. So. What happens here is that I call in my handler. So this is a variation of the handler that uh, that, that ensures that you're logged in. Uh, otherwise, it's the same. So it says show the stream represented by this template file with these parameters here. Now, one thing Lisp is really good at is manipulating data structures, which is actually code. So all I really have to do in order to create a template language is to parse the template and then generate the corresponding Lisp code that would execute that template. That means that if I have a template that just contains raw text, the resulting Lisp code will be a single write, uh, write array that just writes the binary data represented by that page to the screen. It's one instruction compiled to native code. So because of that, there is perhaps a case for me arguing that this is possibly the world's fastest template language under certain circumstances. Uh, those circumstances being there is no logic inside there. But um, even when there's logic, the if statement inside the template is just trans translated into a corresponding if statement in, in, in Lisp code. So I wrote a small a function that I used when I developed the uh, template language so that I can, I can test to see the resulting code. So uh, that one is called debug something, debug parser. And I just put, put my template code in, uh, in, in, in a string. So if I have a template that just contains this, well, there's a lot of stuff around it. But the key here is that the key here is that the entirety of the code compiled into this. So this is UTF-8 representation of that string. However, if I want to say do something like uh, this. So I'm using this kind of so if uh, foo, then uh, I don't know, xx, otherwise else yy, end. And as we can see here, first we write some text, then an if statement followed by two different write sequences depending on which one. So we can see here how this compiles into native code. Then I just pass this through the compiler because in this you have the compiler all the time available. So obviously when I when I do a lookup of the template, the template will the file will uh, uh, it checks the local cache if it's already there. If it is, then it checks if the file has changed. Uh, if it hasn't, then recompile it. So we can take a look at that. Uh, so this one, uh, those are stored in the global variable called cached templates. Uh, and I haven't. So this one is, we can see that it's a hash table that contains zero elements because I have to below the page. Sorry. And there. And, sorry. 
So we've got a debug message saying that it parsed the files. Now this hash table contains two elements. As you can see, the same way, we just since we can just inspect the object live, and we can see that this is a hash table containing two elements. And this is the again the inspector, which is really nice. Uh, and we can see that this is a hash table where these two files are mapped to the corresponding instance of an object parse file. So we can dig down into that and take a look at, okay, so this one is actually uh, an instance of this object that has the modified the time and the name containing a list of the, the, the files that were used to construct this file so that it knows which files to check modification for. Uh, and a function, and this is the function that was compiled when the file was parsed. So it generated the, the, the lambda expression that you saw, it runs it through the compiler, the compiler returns the function object, that is the compiled code, and, well, this is given a, a random internal name because it, it, you don't call it normally, just always call it through this reference. It has this data type, and it has this code, so I can even go in here and, and, and take a look at the uh, at the actual uh, generated uh, source code. So the inspector also allows me to look at the disassembly for any function. Now, obviously, the disassembly is also available through the through the uh, there is a list command for disassemble that prints it, but it's easier to traverse and edit uh, using. Um, using the inspector. Now, this is all cool and stuff, but uh, we need more emails. So, not being happy with this, then I realized that this is a very nice, uh, this application, it's cool and, and all, but it's also a very nice thing to use to experiment with other things. Like, for example, learning how to write a fully fledged Emacs application. So I did. Um, so I decided. So I needed something to test the API because the, the oh now I know why this thing doesn't load. It doesn't load because um, oh crap. Oh no, we don't. Uh, doesn't. Uh, I I haven't started the closure script part yet, um, and because I, I restarted my Emacs, of course. And uh, I guess I should do that. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Um, I should have remembered that. So let's just. Uh... Now I was hoping that my colleague would come today so that he could talk more about how the closure script is used here. Um, I I only use it a bit to develop some parts of the application. Uh, the pro my problem is that I am a terrible web designer. I am the absolute worst. Um, and if you claim that you are worse than me, I challenge you to a competition because you will lose. <laughs> but but I do know I do know my JavaScript and HTML and Clojure script and those things. I just don't know design. Absolutely not. Which makes it even uh, anyway. So uh, while waiting for this, oh wait, okay, there it is. Uh, so let's uh, sorry, let's go and do this and go into the source code because I have put a mnemonic in there uh, as to what command to type to actually connect. Uh, because this is all pretty cool. Um, I can just demonstrate a little bit about it because cider is sort of like slime but for closure. And it also works with closure script. Meaning that when I do this, so let's go to the web page here. And let's see if I can remember this stuff. Uh, so what I, what, I, what I can do here, inspect. So console is here. So I can use uh, plus one, two. So when I run commands like this, you see it takes a little while for this thing to return. It's because my computer is slow and this is actually being executed in this browser. There's a uh, browser plugin that allows me to integrate, integrate this here. Which means that, for example, uh, if I could... Uh, let's see. 
Yeah, if I want to put up a uh, mess, if is it, gosh, what is it? Uh, JS hmm? JS Yeah, like that, right? Yeah. And this should pop up that one here, which means that I can manipulate and look at the state of the actual application on the client through Emacs and using Clojure instead of having to work with uh, JavaScript. So all the, uh, and I get of course all the extensions, so we can do core slash, uh, let's see if we have something interesting. Like I said, most of this mo most of this code is not mine, so that's why. And I haven't worked on this for a little while, so that's why. But anyway, you can look at the variable here. Uh, yeah. Okay. I wouldn't be down with our stack trace. Okay. So. The, here I, I, I just displayed the content of very now since we're using um, <coughs> since we're using React that means that if I were to actually change these objects uh, the, the the underlying uh, closure script objects the um, the GUI changes automatically and so that's how the uh, these fields here like anything I changed on the server side, it propagates all the way down because it updates the the state in the on the browser side, and then the React JS uh, comes into play and updates the GUI to represent the internal state. Anyway, uh, so what I also decided to implement. Oh, sorry. Um, so let's go here to this one. And let's load a little bit of Emacs here. Uh, I implement so to test the the API. I decided to write an Emacs client, of course, because why not? Uh, so let's just even buffer and do the client. Oops, sorry. And it should hopefully connect. And now I'm using the external server there. So let's use uh, what channel I'm on here. I am on tests. Tests. And I, when I type something here, this is a new message. This here, hello, I get. Notifications. Um, and basically, if I if I if I um, if I send a message directly to a user, uh, then um, if that user is not logged in, he will get an email after a while, or there will be a, a notification popping up. Now I'm logging in as the same user on both sides, so even when I do a send a message, a direct message, I will not get notification because obviously you don't get that for messages from, uh, from yourself. But this taught me that you can actually work with pictures as well. So obviously since I uploaded a photo here, let's do it again just to show you that that works. Um, pictures, it's, uh, I have Star Trek pictures, that's all I have because that's all you need. Um, uploaded and hopefully unless I misconfigure anything on my app there and there, there is in Emacs in all its glory. Um, now as I said I didn't really I, I, I in my mind before today I, I went through and I had a number of things in my head that I wanted to mention I wanted to talk about how cool it is to be able to write a, a chat client for, uh, in, 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 um, in Emacs. Now, one interesting thing here is that this file is, okay, uh, okay it's just shy of 1,000 lines of code. Um, and I wanted to mention that uh, Cider allows you to integrate the, with a browser just the same way as Slime allows you to talk to um, 
uh, to, to a communist, uh, in, in, uh, to communist. I wanted to show you the fact that you can. The inspector allows you to not only look at objects, you can modify them, and that you can look at everything, including functions, and it's uh, disassembly. And I also wanted to show how you can uh, can compile functions on the fly, and how those functions can doesn't necessarily just have to be a normal function. It can be stuff that do something more, like register uh, a web handler. Like, like I showed. And uh, so that was essentially the list of things I wanted to mention and show off. And so that sort of covers the things I wanted. Now, I really, really hope that someone has a question. Because that means that there's at least a little bit of interest. <laughs> so, are there any questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, back towards the earlier part of the slide. Yeah. We have the. There it is dynamic reference that's not just text. So the pres called presentation in Slam, yeah. Yeah. Now if you put the cursor on it and do control U, control X equals, I'd like to see what we get. So can you Ah, you mean how it's implemented? Yes. Yeah. You are right. So I wanted to everyone to see this yeah. and see why it Ah, that is very, very so actually the same th I do the same thing in uh, in the uh, chat client, and let me use the chat client instead because it's simpler to understand. Um, so let's go to hello. So okay, it's we had to reconnect. So so again, let us see how I implemented uh, this. So uh, user references. So let's uh, put, for example, someone's name. Uh, one of my test users. Uh, ah, okay. Test. So, how? So, uh, the thing is, here, what you're seeing on the screen right now is just the word test, a name, and test. Okay, fine, there are some color changes, whatever. But when I press return, what I need to send to the server is not just this string. I need to send the user ID of the user that I typed in. So how do I handle this here? Because what I manipulate here is just text. And this is exactly the same, uh, the same problem that the designers of Slime uh, was faced, uh, were faced with when they have to connect some extra information to some piece of information on um, uh, uh, in, 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 in um, they have to add some, uh, attach some extra information to some text in an Emacs buffer. So let's do it again, uh, just to see. Well, one trick here, for example, if I remove this, the, it's, it's no longer a reference to, to the user. Uh, so then, of course, the, the, the highlighting disappears. So how is this actually done? So, what the recommendation was to use control U, control X equals, which will show information about the character here, the D in this case, what is actually there. And this is a super use useful feature, especially it will show you what font, that's cool, and it shows me the actual character, and it shows me the Unicode name, it should show me somewhere, ah, the code point here, 64, that's a Unicode code point. All of this is useful, but it also shows me that there's an, uh, something called an overlay. And in this particular case, the overlay specifies an altern uh, alternate face, and the face is a set of attributes governing how a character is displayed. In this particular case, uh, it's the one for potato message input user name, which is just gray background black text. It also has a modification hook in case I change it, then I need to remove the reference, and then the, the, the special one, potato user ref. This, so the overlay is simply just a set of, uh, it's a key value map, essentially. It's a bit more clever than that, but suffice, uh, that's good enough now. So in this case, the key potato user ref contains a string, which is the um, 
uh, which is the uh, ID of the object in the database. So I go here, I can of course go here, and I should be able to put that in the database. And if it's, you know, ah, okay, no, because that's on the, this is on the remote server. So, yeah. But anyway, if I, if I were connected to that one, I would get this co uh, corresponding information for that user. Now, overlays, when you copy and paste, uh, overlays uh, don't, no, uh, the overlays don't uh, come with the, the um, they don't follow the text when you copy and paste. So the overlay just sits there, but if you, you know, uh, I mean, if you edit before and after, it follows the text. But as soon as I remove it, or try to copy it or anything, it, it, it disappears. Now in Slime's case, you can copy and paste it, but that's because Slime is a bit clever. Um, that they do stuff that I didn't really want to, but I mean, I could. Uh, what they do here, and we can take a look at it. As you can see here, they have a modification hook. They are inserted behind in the front hooks. These are functions that are called uh, oh wait, these are the properties, sorry. Yeah, uh, these are functions that are called when certain things happen to a specific given part of the text. And in Slime's case, what they do is they know, they, they check if you try to copy it, then you take the information and you uh, then you reference, create a new reference to the newly copied uh, structure, um, uh, so element. But in essence, the underlying functionality is the same. Now, as you can see, they use the text pro uh, properties and overlay. Text properties are uh, kind of like overlays, but they are attached directly to characters. They do follow the characters when you copy and paste it. Um, and, but overlays are, are objects in, in their own rights. Text properties is only for one character has a certain property. Uh, so what I do, I also take advantage of that in, the, uh, in my um, uh, sorry. In this uh, in the test here, so as you can see, now it says ABC uh, there. So if I decide to say delete that, it should disappear from the uh, in the in the Emacs here. Or if I decide to edit it, uh, let's just change this text, and it changes. So. I use text properties in order to be able to, so when a message comes to the browser, uh, to, sorry, to the Emacs application that says, oh, a message has been changed or it has been deleted, it contains the information, it contains the message ID. So in order for me to be able to find the message ID, I actually assign the message ID as a property to this text here. Which means all I have to do is have just have to search the buffer for some characters that has this message ID associated with it, and I can then uh, manipulate the text just like any other Emacs code. And of course, I also need to be able to store the timestamp because when a message comes in, it may actually be an older message because sometimes. Uh, messages don't come into the right, in, in the right order, so I just need to be able to put it in the right place. So I also track the timestamp in a proper ISO 8601 format, so I don't have to try to parse this stuff, because this, depending on language, this may be different, but the actual underlying uh, data is stored in, in, in a standardized format here. So that's how you can put ex a lot of extra information uh, together with text. So, as you can see, the buffers in Emacs is not just text, it's the text but with a lot of extra additional information uh, associated with, with the actual characters. So, I think that was an absolutely astonishingly excellent question. Thank you. I would pat you on the back if it wasn't for the fact that I was sitting so far away. Um, I think the analogy of Text properties are kind of like extra attributes. And you can assign sure. assignment to something and make an allegation. Sure, yes, why not? Emacs, Emacs is a uh, buffer substring function which is just a buffer substring, it's going to copy all the text properties with it. 
So you actually have to serve up stuff from the stream, no properties if you just want text. Otherwise you get a bunch of this stuff. Yeah, there's another function that can strip the text properties of yeah, the stream. And, and we can we can show that actually. Look, uh, if I put uh, let's uh, let's see what the value of point is now. Uh, so point is uh, three one four eight. So let's just do this. So I do um, uh, buffer substring no properties point and uh, point uh, plus three. So I take three characters from point. That should give me food. This returns a string foo. Let's see what it looks like when I take buffer substring. And as you can see, this is actually also a string, <coughs> but it contains a bunch of properties. All the functions in Emacs uh, that works with strings, they work with these objects too. But when you display them, uh, they look a bit weird. But it's actually because it's the string. The only part you're interested in is in this part here. The rest is just saying, Technically, this says between character number zero and three, you have these properties set, so you can have a lot more complicated uh, sets. Of, you know, parts of the string may have some properties, other parts may have others. And uh, if you use the done Android programming, you probably notice this already. It's similar to the uh, spans uh, in Android. Right. Yes. Uh, Control, uh, so control new control x equals is a function called uh, what occurs to you. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, you won't actually come up like that, it's kind of annoying. So if you do loss hit, you can get it. Yeah, you're right. What occurs position. No, I'm using control x. Oh. Uh, control h uh, k. So without the detail of you, you just get this kind of like very nothing thing and you can think, oh, this is going to be useful. Do you get yeah. Everything. One of these days, I'm going to make Ctrl X equals do swap them because yeah. I don't think I've ever needed Ctrl X equals. But you Ctrl you Ctrl X equals so I, all the time. I do Ctrl X equals a lot because I do I do Emacs things. Emacs what? I make I, I make dozens of Emacs things. Does Control U, Control X equals show you the so properties it's like now? A, it's like a um, extra complicated display face for, for the current cursor point. But I don't know, it just gives me this. No, no, with Control U. Oh, sorry, no, no. With control. Exactly, Control U. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I use. What yeah. I'm saying is that Control X equals I never ever use. It's useless, yes. Yeah. It's complete. So, what I, I'm, one of these days, I'm going to make Control X equals B, Control U, Control X equals B. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's some of the things that you can do uh, if you like Lisp. So I managed to create an entire workflow with this application where there is Lisp everywhere. Literally everywhere if you, if you want to call Clojure Lisp, which some people do. Um, so that's cool, I think. Um, any other questions from someone else? Maybe? Yes. yes. Uh, Cider actually uses what? Overlays quite a bit. Cider uses Overlays quite a bit. I'm sure it does. It needs, you need to. Yeah, does slide do it? Like, if I evaluate S expressions in my buffer itself, there will be overlay by the study that tells me what the evaluation itself is. Does slide do it? Uh, are you sure? Are you, are you overlay? I mean, Overlays is just a very, um, very low level fundamental concept where you attach, um, create an object that belongs to a range of characters. That's all an overlay is. It has no visual representation at all unless you choose to give it a special visual representation. For example, in both overlays and, and the properties, you can add uh, some extra text that is displayed but it's not actually part of the buffer. So you can do yeah. the opposite. Or you can mark a section as being not shown, which is what the hiding features in, in org mode, for example, that's when you press or, tab. Or uh, pretty symbols. So if you have like, JS with pretty symbols on, you can have functions and like um, or like a high show kind of thing, where you just hide a block text and it leaves a thing there, but it's not really a text. Right. Right. right, you create an overlay that 
changes the appearance of the characters, but the characters in the buffer are still the same. So, um, yeah, uh, do you have the closure scripting open? Like, just open a random CLGS file. Random CLGS, uh, short. Uh, CLGS, uh, for example, let's do the core one. Yeah? And just uh, go to any function and press Ctrl and I. This one? Yeah. Yeah, and what do you want to press what? Control meta x. Control meta x. Oh, it doesn't? Right, first, when I do it, it actually creates a very fresh set function that tells me what the very few results are. And I really like that because I don't actually have to go and look at the repo and see what the results are. Oh, you, okay. Uh, that thing, yeah, that's interesting because have you tried that with Cloud Script? The thing is, you're using Cider directly. I'm using Cider with Clojure Script. There's a new function in, in Cider that's actually just, like, it's called Cider Jacket in Clojure Script. So it, it links you directly to your Clojure Script repo rather than having to run the repo Right, that's, that's why I actually wanted uh, my colleague to talk a little bit more about the Clojure Script part because, like I said, I didn't. <coughs> I wrote, um, I'm probably a pretty bad Clojure Script developer. Um, I, yeah, um, I get, I get by, but frankly, um, I can't say I like it much. But it's better than JavaScript. But it's not, it's not hard to be better than JavaScript. So. Um, yeah, so basically 90% of my time was spent on writing the server code. So there, that's where I put my focus and my... Uh, I mean, if I needed to do uh, more Cloud Script development, sure, I'll probably uh, look into more what you can do. But that kind of uh, executing a function uh, like this, uh, like you said, um, I don't, I, I don't really, never had really the need to do it. I just start the REPL and just type the command from there. And uh, uh, because you can, you can do that stuff in Slime, and I rarely do it there either. So usually, what I do when I want to experiment and I want to develop a new function, uh, I very often uh, start from the innermost part. For example, let's say I want to create a function that calls a REST API. Um, return some data, manipulate that data and return some representation of that data. So what I typically do is I simply start by typing, okay, drachma, uh, HT, so drachma is HTTP library in this HTTP request, uh, google.com, for example, and okay, and oops, okay, there is the data, and then I start to maybe, okay, we assign that to a variable, and then I want to do something with that variable, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, and, and then I, I continue like this, and I start to build up something that sort, kind of, sort of does what I want. When I have that, I paste it into a file, put the define around it, and finish it, finish it up that way. Right. So, so in this case, for example, I would I would have this, and let's say this is pretty much what I wanted. Okay, I take this, I I, I copy that, and uh, let's go into web dot lisp, and then so I would probably end up doing something like this: the fun something uh, URL, paste it there. Oh, and then I realize, okay, this one should be the URL. I compile that there, and then in here, and I do. Um, something I don't know. So I want, oh, I want to attack there. I want to spam them a little bit. Right? So that's sort of the way I would be developing a new function that does something. So I test it out through the REPL and then I just into the file, compile it with Ctrl C, Ctrl C done. It's in there. Now it's available to be used <coughs> by by everything else. My next question is: uh, Let's say you're developing a very long function and something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about doing that? That's all you know, you, Like even in Emacs, like for your Emacs client, for example, you you you'll be writing you're you're writing this function and then something goes wrong. Right. Uh, normally. Um, 
If there's one weakness in, in well, it depends on what uh, common we're using. If you're using SPCL, for example, SPCL's tracing functionality is somewhat limited. Uh, I don't really use it much, so, so let's, let's just construct an error, right? So first, the, uh, by default, uh, the, uh, the web server does not uh, stop when there's an error, it just logs the error because you don't want it to just break into the debugger. So we have to set the variable catch errors p to nil, and this will disable the catching and logging functionality so I get a proper error. Then uh, let's go to the, um, sorry, uh, let's go to the, so this is the file that contains the definition of the handler for the channel. So when it shows the channel, let us go instead, before showing the stream, let's um, uh, print one over zero. This should give me a divide by zero, right? Ctrl C, Ctrl C, recompile that, I reload this page and arithmetic error division by zero. So this breaks me into the debugger. And this is the, and as you can see, we get divide one by zero, it's very easy. The question then is, where did it happen? Well, I can press, I can go to the line and I press V, that will bring me to the source line. Now, this in this case, it only brought me to the first line of the function. Why is that? Well, it's because the function is is, uh, is optimized. So there's no, no debug information. So uh, we can, oops, sorry, I tried the web browser it keeps trying to reload the page, it's frustrating. It's, it's a Chrome thing and I hate it so much. Okay, anyway, um, so you can press Ctrl U, Ctrl C, Ctrl C, or I could have changed my default compile declaration to uh, something, um, uh, I, because I, I have this global variable that sets, sets what's uh, what optimization level to use, and uh, I could also set that one and decompile all the files. That would, of course, compile. But with Ctrl U, Ctrl C, Ctrl C, I can compile a file, but with full debug and make for a given function only. And in this particular case, that's enough. Normally, when you develop, you would just simply compile everything with maximum debugging, so you never have to worry about that. So let's just go back to the page and wait for the error. And it never came. Okay. Ah, there it is. And now it jumps. Uh, jumps. So as you can see, right when I press V, it highlights a specific part, just the part of the expression where the error occurred. In this particular case, I got uh, a compile error as well because your compilation is good fun that. But so, but what the debugger, all, uh, what the uh, debugger also gives me is the entire stack trace here. And if they are green, that means that they are. Uh, uh, I have the source code available for it. And the source code, um, uh, and the source code is, is, is reasonably, it's not optimized, uh, or not fully optimized. Essentially, it means I can go to it, so I can jump to this line, this line. Uh, yeah. And I can also press return, and I can see, for example, these are the local variables. Uh, I can also see the parameters that were passed. So uh, the call with login handler, this function, uh, where is it? Here. This function call with login handler takes an argument called bodyfn, and we can see. Oops. Sorry. We can see that bodyfn is is passed because it's called with a function. And of course, I can I can further inspect that function. I can see. Uh, because it's closure, I can even see what values is closed over. And in fact, you can actually change them, uh, if I remember. No, wait, can you? Oh, no. You might be able to, I never tried, but I think you can. Uh, and you can, of course, go in and look at the actual function and go this deep if you, if you want to. 
uh, which is kind of neat coming from just a stack trace from a running environment. And remember, when you are remotely connected, even to a production environment, you can do this. So I've done that on a production environment uh, on, on when the application was running, and I had to fix a small bug. I fixed it in the in the repository, and then I realized. We don't want to do a redeploy of the application because that's annoying and that causes people to lose their session and then it reconnects half a minute later and that's annoying. So I just went in, connected, created the function, changed, it, compiled another function, done. Took seconds. And uh, yeah. So I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So let's see. And now the browser decided to keep the loading again as usual. And XVU and done. Right. Uh, any other questions? Yep. That's the thing. Um, I've been doing open source development for a very, very long time. <coughs> but one thing I realized was that working with third party libraries in Lisp is so much nicer than any other language. And one of the reasons for that is, uh, let's take a look, for example, just uh, as we were, uh, I just called um, here, Drachma HTTP request. So HTTP request is the, the Drachma library is the, is the main library everybody uses for HTTP. It's really good. It takes a million parameters because HTTP is complicated. But it doesn't matter because all the time I can always, and this is any library, I can always try to make that dot and I will jump to the oh, this big function. Uh, where is it? Uh, where does it start? Why doesn't it jump to the right? I think here is it. This is function. So I can always jump into the function. So I can see, okay, what does this do? Well, it does stuff. Uh, let's see if you find something interesting. Uh, I don't know. What does so Flexi Streams is a third-party library that does. Uh, it allows you to create streams that wraps in other streams with different encodings, things like that. Same thing here, fix a stream element type. I just press that function and I realize that, okay, it has a generic function with one implement, with one method, so let's jump to the method. And there it is. And this, this one is, as we can see, part of the FlexiStream library. So now I jumped into a different one. If I want to make a change to this third part library, I modify the code. I press Ctrl-C, Ctrl-C. It's right there. It's modified and ready to go. And I have contributed to so many external libraries where I might have contributed to a handful of Java ones, maybe two or three in my entire life. Not because I can't, but because it's such a hassle. If you are working in a Java project, and let's say, for example, that you want to make a small change to, I don't know, the RabbitMQ Java library. You might have the source code, but the source code is in a jar file that was downloaded just for reference. If you want to change that, you have to clone the project, you have to build it, you have to then integrate your version into your build process, and just doing that might take half an hour just for you to be able to make a small modification to a file to make a small change to this third part library. And then you want to push that change upstream. No, it's a hassle. In Lisp, you never do that. You just jump into the file, because you have all the files, make a modification, press Ctrl C, Ctrl C, done. If you want to push the change, fine, you have to clone, but you already have the change, so you take a diff and you just submit the diff. So that's why if you go to my GitHub, you will see a very long list of projects. A lot of them are mine, but a lot of them are third-party projects that I've just contributed stuff to because it's so easy. And that, I think, is the absolute beauty of doing open source development in Lisp because the community is so welcoming and it's so easy to become part of it. And the final thing is, personally, I find uh, looking at, a, uh, at third party Lisp code is much easier. When you are looking, trying to find out what the Java library is doing, you have to navigate so many classes. You have to understand the, the way the objects fit together, how conceptually the, the, the infrastructure works. This code tends to be much more straightforward. There's so, you can fit so much code in a single function, or sorry, not so much code, but you can fit so much logic in a single function without having to have three million classes. Slight exaggeration, but not much.
it's cultural, isn't it? I mean, Java can be written in many ways, but it just turns out that yeah. a particular set of names yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, um, I'm I'm writing Java at work, and uh, I find myself. I mean, I find myself writing the kind of code I don't want to write. I find myself writing code that where I think about it and I say, if I were a third party looking at this code, what would I think? And I wouldn't be happy. And I realize it's very hard to not get that feeling when you write Java. Yeah. And the thing is, I actually like Java uh, for what it is. It's not bad. It just... Uh, it I don't know. I can't even... Yeah. It doesn't make you happy. No. Right. No, it doesn't. It's nice to have a language which makes you... Like, yeah. This is fun. At least it's hard to screw up in it. So, which is... Which is a good thing, I guess, when you when you work on a large project with hundreds of developers, which I am, but but still, it's not. Yeah, it's not exciting. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah, and and of course, all of these benefits. I mean, when it comes to the language itself and the benefits of the language itself, that translates over to the Emacs disk, of course. So the fact that, uh, and, and, and that translates also to the to when you work with third-party Emacs Lisp libraries, and, and uh, there that code is obviously much more uh, fun uh, to to uh, to work with than if Emacs had used I don't know Java as an extension language. <laughs> yeah. How does Common Lisp compare to Emacs Um well, um, Emacs Lisp takes a lot of ideas from Common Lisp. A lot of uh, knowledge and uh, a lot of things you know about one will transfer over to the other. Um, I think the key difference is, uh, one of the key differences is that Emacs Lisp does not have a package system. You don't have modules or namespaces, which can be incredibly frustrating for someone like me that is used to Common Lisp. Uh, but in terms of the way the language behaves, for example, um, Emacs Lisp used to be completely used dynamic binding all the time. That has changed in 23, 24, 23, when they introduced 24. Uh, they introduced uh, lexical bindings, which is the recommended way to, to do it now, and that is what Common Lisp has always been using. And Emacs Lisp's object system, E I E I O. <laughs> Um, Emacs something something object something something object. I don't know. Uh, that is more that's actually the official name. Yeah, probably. Oh, and they back it into something else. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. So that is uh, more or less a a, a, um, a direct translation of the common list object system plus, which I could probably do. I could do an entire session just talking about what plus is and what it can do and uh, how awesome it is compared to. Uh, uh, other object systems. So yeah, um, it, it is very similar to the point where some people on the Emacs, Emacs mailing list has proposed that perhaps the underlying Lisp engine in Emacs should be Comlisp instead. Uh, making that change wouldn't be that hard. Comlisp has some interesting features that allows you to uh, create your own. You can uh, manipulate a reader, for example, uh, so that you can add new syntax. Um, so it is possible to add uh, to within the common Lisp standard. You can alter, you can let the language alter its own syntax to the point where it could actually read the Emacs Lisp code uh, without change. You have to create a new evaluator, or some things like that, but in, but you could still read it. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, so they're quite simple uh, enough that a Emacs Lisp pro programmer should not have any problems getting used to common Lisp. Well, this is a common Lisp specific question. You mentioned that you compile everything to the binary, right? Yeah. So when you connect most to the most common Lisp implementations do, with a few exceptions. So when you connect to the repo in the binary and you edit a file, does the binary change? Uh, well, there is no binary file. The binary file, the, the, the executable, is only generated when you choose to. It changes it in memory, it compiles it in memory. Each file, compiled file, gets what's called a fastload file, .fasl, 
and that one compi contains the compiled content of the corresponding file. It's only used when you load it in a runtime. It's not used when you create the binary. But what I can show you in terms of... Uh, huh? uh, I think the question is, if you are doing live reading writing in a running binary like when you're on your server, you can't write your changes back, or can you? Well, normally... <laughs> yeah, if you just if you define a function like this, the function x one plus x. Okay, this creates a function that adds one to the argument. This function only exists in the running image. So this is something you have to keep in mind. So if I were to create a, edit a file in my source code that calls the function foo, that would work until I restart. Then the function would not be there anymore. However, uh, by the way, with, uh, when talking about native code, uh, I can show one thing that is kind of cool uh, that perhaps uh, uh, some people have not seen. If we take a look at the function foo here, as we, as we know, it's a function that adds one to x. So let's look at, the, uh, let's look at what kind of assem uh, assembly that one generates. And you will see that it's not very optimized. This is the entire function, but as you can see, it makes a call to, an, to another function called generic plus. Why is that? Well, it's because the compiler does not know what kind of argument you pass in, because you don't declare variables normally in this one. So this, you could pass in a string, and then you have to throw an exception. Or it, you could, for example, pass in a very large number, so it's a big number. Or you could perhaps pass in a complex, or a floating complex. So generic plus is a function that can handle all of this. It basically has a big case statement where it checks the type and then it, it's implemented internally as efficient as it can. But if you know, um, if you know that the type of x is a fixed number, Let's just add optimize speed three safety zero. And you know that it will never ever be called with anything but a fixed number. A fixed number is a number that fits in a register. Then the function can be much more uh, much more optimized. So let's take a look at it. Oops, sorry. Um, let's take a look at the code. Now it's not fully optimized yet, but as you can see here is that what happens is that it does the addition uh, somewhere uh, here. No. Ah, yeah, so here it does the, uh, an increment. But what if the value is the maximum value of a fixed number? F, 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 F. Then the result has to be a big number. Which is why there is an if statement. It, che it, it checks uh, if it's if it fits, then it uh, returns. Otherwise, it calls the function alloc sign big num in RDX, which allocates a uh, big num. But perhaps you know that the type is not just a fixed num; it's actually an integer between zero and uh, thousand. Then we know. Then the function should you should be able to optimize it really well. And it should be, as you can see. It just becomes an add. The reason it adds two is because the way values in common list uh, are handled is, uh, is that you can have a value in a register. So it's a 64-bit value. But this value could be a pointer. It could be an integer, it could be a floating point, it could be a pointer to some object, or it could be a, a, a one half of, 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 a, of, a, um, of a rational number, or it could be a one quarter of a, of a complex number built up from rationals. Now, what they do is they let the lowest bits, the least significant bits, indicate the type or the, the, the low significant bits. But if that bit is zero, that means it's a fixed number. So it doesn't have to check for it because it knows it's a fixed number. I told it it fits in the register, which means it's a fixed number. In which case, adding two means you add one, but with the last bit being what it is, uh, being always zero. And then it just 
uh, just moves it into RBP, which is the return value, and just returns. So as you can see, you can optimize code very, very heavily just by adding the right type specifications. I uh, ported over a JavaScript implementation of a, um, uh, basically I, I was writing a game and I needed to do create a map. So I, I took an existing implementation of a, a fractal uh, uh, generator, what's it called? Um, uh, it's a standard algorithm. Anyway, it's called something. So anyway, I ported it over from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from JavaScript. It took, I don't know, 30 seconds to generate the map. But after I added some type declarations here and there, it was down to you know, one second, or less than a second. So you can have a huge difference. It, it, it was an extreme case because it was a, an inner loop that was super uh, badly optimized. Once I added the right type declaration, the, the loop was just one instruction. So typically, you could, for, for heavily compute, computation heavy routines, you can probably see between 10 and 20 times improvement. Uh, just by adding the right type declarations. But of course, this function is now very dangerous. If I do this, uh, now I get, this is an error. I've corrupted the, the image now. Uh, at some point later, I will get a quarter from this guy. This will never happen if you, if you, if you always, set, if you set safety to zero, that can happen. But as long as you keep safety as one or above, it will always do the correct type checking. So this stuff will never happen. But now I have to restart the, the entire thing because, just, just to come back to the rest of Jethro's question from hmm? before, when you did that hot fix in production, you said you didn't want to do it before, right? Yeah. So if, if that server process had been killed for whatever reason, that would have reverted, it would have rid of the binary to revert to its own state. Right. So you still had to do a subsequent deploy. Yeah, no, yeah, I, 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 did, I, did, I did recompile the binary. Okay. But I didn't do a full redeploy because I, the full redeploy packages up the, all the CSS files and that stuff and, uh, and prepares it for, uh, compiles, the, uh, it compiles all the closure script code into the production. So, because the production generation is, is highly compressed into a single file, but when you do development, it's many files. Sure. So a full deploy does that, but I knew that I didn't change any of that. So I just modified the file, compiled the new binary, and then I did the hotfix in the, in the, in the running uh, instance. And then you just found the deployment. Later, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I knew that it was good now, so next time we did a real deployment, everything would be there. But yeah, when you do that, you have to be careful. You have to know what you're doing. Sure. Uh, so I don't recommend anyone going in and doing primary development of the application on pro, unless it's something where you're really okay with losing all the data or something. So I have a PhD background that sounds worth a single thing. Uh, what? <laughs> 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 um, I, I've heard about PHP. Uh, <laughs> I read the article, A Fractal of Bad Design, that I'm sure everybody's read. That's, all my knowledge about PHP stems from that document. So I mean bad being good, though, right? Have you read it? <laughs> well, the good thing is you deploy my HTTPs. We have a nice ref for clients to do deployments. I mean, that, that's a positive. It's great. Fantastic. <laughs> what could be simple? Yeah, no, I, I try to uh, uh, kind of sort of stay away from things I don't like as long as, as much as possible.